24, 1922. Berlin is basking in wonderful summer sunshine, and as is his wont, when the sun is shining, the German foreign minister, Walter Rathenau, instructed his chauffeur to bring out the open black limousine, which would drive him from his villa at the suburb of Grunewald to his office in the Wilhelmstrasse. Also, as was his wont, he was alone on the back seat. As a government minister, as a cabinet minister, he was entitled to full-time, round-the-clock police protection. But he always rejected it. He said to a friend he didn't want to be uh, shut in and overlooked by a police presence all the time. And also, despite increasingly violent threats to his life, he didn't change his routine. He took the same route every day from home to the office. In fact, he was a sitting duck. As he was making his way in the car, another open car drove up next to him. There were two passengers in the back. One of them took out a machine pistol and shot Rathnau, and the other lobbed a hand grenade into the limousine. There was a big explosion, and the back of the car shot up. A hospital nurse was passing, and she came to the aid of Rathenau. The chauffeur drove them at top speed to the nearest police station while the hospital nurse sat in the back cradling Rathenau in her arms, but to no avail, he was dead. The two assassins, former army officers, Erwin Kern, age 23, and Hermann Fischer, age 26, escaped to Salek Castle in Saxony, where the caretaker was a sympathizer with the far-right nationalist uh, nationwide terrorist organization to which they belonged, named Organization Consul, that together with other similar groups had already murdered or attempted to murder over 300 people from 1918 at the establishment of the Weimar Republic until the date 1921. Most notably, gunning down in August 1921, Matthias Erzberger, who was the head of the Catholic Center Party and who had been part of the German delegation that had signed the Treaty of Versailles. The vehemence of insult hurled at Rathenau from extreme right parliamentary parties within Reichstag, particularly by Karl Helferich, the leader of the Deutsche National Volkspartei, was not a new phenomenon. But on the day before the murder, Helferich's attacks were particularly poisonous. And they can be seen as being a license to assassinate Rathenau the following day. On the day following the assassination, uh, Chancellor Wirth, Josef Wirth, stood up in the Reichstag and pointed dramatically to his right, saying, here is where the enemy lies. There is no doubt about it, this enemy is on the right. Rathenau's murder is one amongst many shocking deeds performed with the same intent was meant by the perpetrators to create enough chaos to bring down the Republic. Instead, over half a million Germans turned out in Berlin in a mass demonstration that had been organized by the trades union movement, over 500,000 people, with other demonstrations in Hamburg, Munich, uh, Breslau, Essen, and Chemnitz. A rapid and countrywide police manhunt ensued. It was the largest that had ever taken place on German soil. It tracked down the killers, and on the 17th of July, they saw the police surrounded the castle. In the ensuing shootout, Karen was killed and Fischer committed suicide. But what about the driver? Ernst Tetschau, at 20 years old, too young to have served in the army in the war, was turned into the police by his parents. He stood trial with other conspirators of the group, but got off with a lenient sentence, even though he was being tried for murder and the others weren't, uh, because he said he had been coerced and threatened with death by the other two if he didn't go along. But what's interesting about his trial is that the judge asks Turchow if he knew that uh, Rathenau was a member of the 300 elders of Zion, a self-confessed member. And Tirchow said yes, 
And the judge said, have you read the 300 elders of Zion, which is the protocols of Zion? And he said again, yes. And he said, therefore, he felt that they were, the gang was justified in murdering Rathenau because he was a member of this group. The state prosecutor cited blind hatred of Jews as the motive behind the killing. Now, in, there was a problem that had arisen with Rathenau's own writings, because in 1909, he wrote an article in the Neu Freie Press of Vienna, and there's one sentence that kept being taken out of context from it that goes thus, 300 men, all of whom know one another, direct the economic destiny of the continent and choose their successors from their area. Now, Rathenau is actually being critical of the very idea that there could be this oligarchy. And he certainly wasn't saying that he believed that he existed, it existed, nor that it was made up of Jews, nor that he was a part of it. Now, unfortunately, by 1912, uh, a very influential and highly anti-Semitic um, journalist called Theodor Fritsch, who was a publisher as well, took this as proof that there indeed was a worldwide Jewish conspiracy and that Rathenau was the secret Kaiser of Germany. Virulent anti-Semitism killed Walter Rathenau. Born in 1867 as a third generation Berliner, the elder son of a wealthy Jewish family, his father Emil, a successful industrialist, had founded the Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft. Um, he had bought the European rights to Edison's electric light bulb and became one of Germany's uh, most successful entrepreneurs. And I think he was the fourth of the six rich, rich, richest man in Germany in his day. His electrical company, AEG, remains a household name more than 100 years later. Always trying to win his father's love and approval, Walter struggled to achieve success and financial independence from Emil. Walter was very close to his mother and wrote constantly to her, and once he had his own home, visited her daily when they were both in Berlin. Now, a note about Walter's personal life. He was very close to his mother. She was the first of several female confidants to whom he wrote regularly. He had, of course, a voluminous correspondence. And um, there's only one woman who really appears to have been a constant in his life, apart from Mama, and that was Lily Deutsch, who unfortunately and complicated the issue by being the wife of Fritz Deutsch, who was Emil's number two in AEG. That rather complicated things. But uh, there's only the letters to go by. There's no evidence that they had an affair, that there was any form of sexual relationship. Walter was also rumored, and many of his biographers have tried to prove, I don't think successfully, that he was a homosexual. Now, if he was, and if, or if he'd had an affair with Lily, he would have been very, very careful to keep everything terribly quiet because it would have ruined his life. He was a very cautious man. He was uh, not a passionate man. And he was very ambitious, ambitious to go into politics, ambitious to become recognized as a writer, ambitious to rise as high as he could in the elite society of the time. And unfortunately, the many letters that he and Lily exchanged on Rathenau's death, his mother burnt uh, Lily's letters to him. And his letters to Lily, unfortunately, disappeared with Lily in 1939 when she was escaping from Nazi Germany. But we have a few. And one of his friends, whom we'll meet in a moment, wrote the first biography of him. But we feel that it was quite restrained, and he obviously knew a lot more than he was telling. But again, we have no proof of, of any goings on. At the very end of Walter's life, Lord Beaverbrook, the newspaper publisher, summed up Walter as one of those 
pedagogically inclined Jewish philosophers without a clear overview of the situation and without a precise plan for the solution of the problems. This was an extraordinarily apt summary of much of Rathenau's conflicted career. Much of the conflict arose within Walter's view of himself as a German Jew. Against his father's wishes, and this would be sort of a, a typical example, um, after university, he joined as a reservist an elite Prussian cavalry unit. Now, there was no way, of course, that he'd become an officer in such a regiment, although as a reservist, a very slight chance. Now, here is a typical Walter situation. He works incredibly hard for promotion. He, he fulfills all the requirements, all the boxes get ticked. You know, he gets top marks in everything, but he keeps being continually refused promotion. And looking back at this, Walter wrote, in the early years of every German Jew, there is a painful moment that can never be forgotten when he becomes aware for the first time that he's entered the world as a second-class citizen and that no amount of talent and merit would free him of this status. One of Rathenau's talents was as an artist. In his student days, he was well known for his um, caricatures and his pen and ink drawings. And interestingly, his uncle was the famous painter Max Lieberman. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that um, Walter was equally talented, but certainly an artistic career would have been a possibility. And he, he continued to paint and draw throughout his life, and I've seen photographs of some of them, and they are really extremely good. He was definitely talented. Um, but he decides to join his father in Emil's grand industrial project. After some apprenticeship time away from home, Emil brought Walter back to Berlin to put him on the board of directors of AEG. In Berlin, now in his late 20s, Walter's interest switched from painting to literature. He was drawn to Maximilian Harden, who was also of a Jewish background, but he had converted and totally left his Judaism behind. He was uh, well known as a publisher, and he uh, published a weekly journal, I hope no one here speaks German, Die the future. In 1897, Walter published through Harden his first proper essay entitled Here, O Israel. This short piece is a frontal attack on German Jews for failing to fully assimilate, for living in a semi-voluntary invisible ghetto, for being a foreign organism within a German body, um, which has resonates rather badly, I think. This expression of repugnance for certain types of Jews, which is apparent self-hatred, was really more part of his attempt to work out a viable construct for himself as a German Jew without losing his honor. This was a major theme of his life. Unlike many assimilated Jews, he felt obliged to constantly remind people of who he was even though this honesty did not help him as he tried to climb the social ladder. His integrity also didn't help his attempts to create a political career. Upon first meeting Prince Bernard von Bülow, who was chancellor from 1900 to 1907, uh, he said, Your Highness, before I am granted the honor of speaking with you, I want to make a statement that is also a confession. Your Highness, I am a Jew, as if Vula didn't realize it. <laughs> and in fact, Vula had hoped to bring Rathenau into government as it would be good to have a token unconverted Jew. There were several converted Jews who had risen quite high, but not an unconverted one. Anyway, he takes to Walter and sends him to accompany two investigative missions to the German colonies in Africa, one to East Africa, to Tanganyika, and the second one to Namibia in west, southwest Africa. Um, and Walter was to write reports to prove whether he was worthy of the confidence that Vula wanted to place in him as a potential addition to his government. Um, the first report was very typical of Walter. It was vacillating and walking down the middle of the road, as he thought. 
it went between condemnation for the way the people were being treated in Tanganyika and sympathy. But the second report, which dealt with the Germans' treatment of the Herero people in Namibia, where 80% of them, men, women, and children, were killed by the Germans in various ways, um, made him, he had to get off the fence. He couldn't remain trying to, to walk this tightrope. And he was definitely critical of Germany's conduct in her colonies, particularly comparing it unfavorably to the way the British treated their subjects in South Africa. He couldn't have picked a worse comparison <laughs> to Germans. Thus nipping his political aspirations in the bud. He was always very critical in his essays of the current political, the extant political situation and system, controlled by the aristocratic Pr Prussian Junker elite, which excluded talent, not just Jews, but uh, well-educated, well-qualified, middle-of-the-road bourgeoisie. Uh, and Rathenau really slated this attitude. He wanted a meritocracy. Uh, he also wanted reform but at, uh, of, of the system, but at a cautious pace. The system, and rather now along with it, needed a shock before it could recognize and deal with these issues. This, of course, was to come with the war. Now, he rejected the idea of conversion for himself because he felt it would be disingenuous, as he couldn't believe in Christianity doctrinally. He used Jesus as the example of universal love and brotherhood, frequently referred to in his writings, but not the religious aspect of it. And he felt it would be completely wrong, and this is where his honor comes in, because he would only be using it as a means of self-advancement, which many of his co-religionists did. On the more universal level for other Jews, he also felt conversion wasn't right because it, it was what we would call positive discrimination, that they would be treated differently, which they would have been, and advanced above their fellows, even though they might not be any better qualified or any more intelligent, but it would be purely because they had converted. Of course, that was the solution for many socially ambitious German Jews. As Heinrich Heine had said about his own conversion, it was a ticket of admission to European culture. Walter continued to produce essays for Dizzy Kunf, bringing out two collections of his work. He also managed to participate fully in the hectic social life of Berlin's intellectual and artistic elite. The diary of his friend, Count Harry von Kessler, describes breakfasts, dinners, after theater soirees, meetings in restaurants, at the Automobile Club, the Hotel Avon, and most of all, in people's homes. Now, despite his privileged and cosmopolitan background, Rathenau was socially extremely inept. Um, he was pompous and dogmatic in his social relationships. People would be initially attracted to him because he was very bright and a, an interesting speaker if you could ever get him to shut up so that you could have a proper um, conversation, which was very difficult. Um, and as Count Harry recalled, entertainment at Rathenau's uh, Berlin, beautifully appointed Berlin villa or country schloss at Freienwald in Thuringia was to be avoided. Too many people too many Jews, too many intellectuals. An Austrian writer living in Berlin, Franz Bly, described an evening at Rathenau's Berlin Villa. The dinner was so modest in quality and quantity, fish, lamb cutlets, and dumplings, that everyone made sure to eat before they came. <laughs> One tiny glass of champagne, never refilled despite a footman behind every chair, and then vats of black coffee intended to keep the guests awake till the small hours while Ratanav lectured at them. But above all, it was his identity as a hard-working industrialist that meant the most to Walter. 
Having left AEG for a stint on the board of the bank, the Berliner Handelsgesellschaft, he then returned to AEG to run it as a member of the supervisory board, and he was now in a position to prepare for greater things to come. He became expert in the establishment and management of many different companies, and he was on the board of directors of 86 German companies and 21 foreign companies. We know from his correspondence that he became very uh, adept uh, at wide run and developed a wide-ranging understanding of financial problems. And most significantly for his end-of-life success, he blossomed as a negotiator. He had become a business figure in his own right, a successful businessman, and a lecture series on the achievements of the electric industry, which was his field, brought him to the attention of the Kaiser, who asked him to repeat a lecture in front of him. And for doing this, Walter received a minor decoration for this, but it was more minor than a friend of his got, so he was not happy. Rathenau's literary celebrity came in 1912. Now, he's constantly writing essays, but with the public, and he writes a few books, with the publication of the Critique of the Times. He critiqued modernity with its central characterization of mechanization, or what we could say industrialization, that made endless cycles of the pursuit of luxury possible. Again, we would call that consumerism, but it, it wasn't called that then. What was needed to replace the reliance on materialism was an inner revival, a reforming of the human will that can break the magic spell to bring about a new way of life, a return to pre-mechanized society clearly not being possible. <coughs> We are en route to the kingdom of the soul, he said, where men are motivated neither by their needs nor by desire for power or amassing of wealth, a messianic age, in fact. This book's ability to irritate was universal. Here was a Jew who persistently insisted on announcing his Jewishness, proclaiming the approach of Christ's kingdom. Here was a man of vast worldly goods and political ambitions preaching the relinquishment of all worldliness for a vague age of the spirit. In contrast to the spiritual transcendental flavor of his longer writings, his best essays from 1912 onwards were political ones. Published on Christmas Eve 1913, Rathenau prophetically expressed his view of Germany's future entitled Germany's Dangers and New Goals. It emphasized the importance of systematic acquisition of raw materials, because compared to the other European powers, Germany had very limited access to natural resources. The only solution, according to Rathenau, and listen to this prophetic bit, was the creation of a customs union of Central European countries and the major Western powers, including Britain and the USA, which would thus rob nationalist hatred of its sharpest sting. The issue that kept Europe from peaceful coexistence, according to Rathenau, was economic. If Europe's economy melts into one common unity, so will its politics leading to mitigation of conflicts, conservation of power, and the solidarity of civilization. The EU could have used him as a PR man. <laughs> this prophetic solution remained vague and undetailed, but with the start of war, his practical suggestions of how Germany uh, could enhance production and control distribution of raw materials in wartime led to his assignment to head up a new raw materials office within the war ministry. Now, this is the point where Rathenau begins to really come into his own a bit, although he later on gets knocked back. He approached this vital area of war effort with such speed and efficiency that he was able to resign after only eight months, having implemented his plan for replacing imported raw materials and using existing stocks in the most efficient way registering all available resources and setting up a system whereby the government could intervene at any point where it was necessary. Despite his undoubted success, there was a downside to this um, accomplishment, and that is he was considered, and he considered himself, to have enabled Germany, Germany 
to carry on fighting for quite a lot longer because they had been in such a dire, dire straits when he came to organize the raw materials that they really would not have lasted till 1918. So this is very upsetting for him in one sense, and other people criticize him for it. He's also accused of favoring AEG with war contracts. Orr was a lonely man. He was now very isolated. And his sense of impotence was added to by the fact that although he opposed the adoption in 1917 of unrestricted submarine warfare, which brought uh, America into the war, he lacked any influence on military matters, despite knowing a lot of the top brass. Now, anti-Semitism was increasing as it became clear that Germany might lose the war. Uh, Rathenau was now repeatedly denounced, along with other wealthy Jews, as having personally benefited from the war. And he became visibly shaken by the anti-Jewish atmosphere, which culminated in the so-called Jewish census, um, which the government took to see how Jews had behaved as soldiers. In other words, they were accused of avoiding frontline warfare and of, in other ways, shirking. Um, and of course, the, the investigation totally um, uh, refused this it totally refuted this accusation. But it came at a point after huge in, in uh, this burst of anti-Semitism uh, that uh, a lot of Jews felt that this was a turning point that finally shook them out of the dream of community and served as proof, according to Ernst Simon, that we were foreigners and served as proof that we were standing at the side, people who must be separately categorized, counted, listed, and administered. In June 1917, Rathenau publishes a polemic of faith, which is a reply to Kurt von Trutzkler Falkenstein's demand that Germany's Jews convert. He wrote a, a pamphlet called The Solution of the Jewish Question in Germany. Rathenau's response was that a Christian state should mean a state inspired by Christian ideals, not one with an official church, but characterized by true spiritual freedom and earthly reflection, reflection of the kingdom of soul, the kingdom of God. On October 2nd, Rathenau had written in the Berliner Tageblatt that Germany could hold out for a few more weeks, contrary to military assessment. Uh, really, his point was that clearly Germany was losing, but you need to find the best possible position for yourself from which to negotiate. And if Germany could hold out for a few more weeks, that might be possible. Uh, immediately after this, Ludendorff calls for a complete and immediate ceasefire, and along with everyone else, Rathenau was very shocked. And to counter this, he does something quite radical and totally uncharacteristic. He calls, basically, for an insurrection. He calls for a German people's army to rise up and continue the fight. Now, he, he was... Uh, backed up by a few other people. This, of course, didn't actually happen. In fulfillment of Rathenau's prophecies, the war ended in revolution. Insurrections started in the port of Kiel and spread from the navy to the army with huge demonstrations all over the country. The chancellor, Max von Baden, was forced to announce the Kaiser's abdication. General elections for a national assembly to form the first German republic took place at the same time as negotiations at Versailles. And Rathenau wrote a letter to President Wilson's personal envoy, special envoy, Colonel Edward House, pleading for his country's future, pleading for Germany not to be destroyed. Rathenau reports to friends that House had been greatly influenced by the letter which he gave to the president. But the final offer from the Allies in Versailles disproves this. They shattered all hopes for Germany. Rathenau continued, despite his disappointment, to engage in public activity, joining in negotiations of the Central Working Committee 
which led to other industrialists creating an eight-hour day and better working conditions for the workers. Now, Germany is really chaotic at this stage. There is constant turmoil. There are constant strikes and demonstrations. And the real fear was that the underlings, the workers, were going to rise up and there was going to be the Russian Revolution all over again. This was a really um, critical time. And therefore, although it sounds very small, getting an agreement for an eight-hour working day, it was actually very significant. <laughs> Um, he also joined the Gem German Democratic Party, the DDP, and seemed ready at last to be able to enter into politics proper and not just try to influence at a high level from the sidelines. He was devastated when the DDP didn't nominate him as a candidate for the National Assembly. His plans for strict economic organization were seen by some as an attack on the constituents that the party sought to represent. Others just thought he was too unpopular to ever be, to ever to win a seat. The entire liberal press was against him, calling him the modern Francis of Assisi, or the most paradoxical living creature of old Germany. To finish him off, Ludendorff, along with his right-wing cronies, as part of the fabrication of the stab-in-the-back theory, started a campaign of slander against Rathenau, basically accusing him of sabotaging the war effort. Attacks came from every wing of the political spectrum until the final straw came when the entire assembly of the Weimar uh, uh, Council uh, Assembly broke into laughter at the suggestion that Rathenau might be asked to be president of the republic. Now, during this time, Rathenau continued to produce prodigious amounts of written work, expanding on his perennial ideas of the new economy, the new state, and the new society, in an essay of the same name. In it, he attacks Germany and the Germans, focusing as of old on the deficiency of the aristocratic leadership and the passivity and submiss submissiveness of the German people. He now leaves writing behind and takes to public speaking often on behalf of the DDP, gaining large audiences and even admirers. And interestingly, the young folk now, he becomes nearly a cult figure for them. They call him charismatic. He also now has frequent meetings with diplomats and businessmen from different countries. His fluency in French, English, and Italian, and his conversational skills are much employed. The urgent problem for Germany now is war repar reparations. Rathenau is sent to Spa to advise the German delegation in July 1920, negotiating with the Allies about large-scale deliveries of coal to France and also disarmament. Now, he's been thinking about reparations for a long time, and here all his skills over the years as an industrialist are brought to bear. He has calculated that a reasonable demand of Germany would be 15 to 20 billion francs. Any more, he reckoned, would bring total ruin to the country. The final figure, of course, after the signing of the Versailles Treaty was far greater. Now, there were delegations, there were differences of opinion within the German delegation between Rathenau and Hugo Stinnes, who was another, his longtime rival industrialist. But in a sense, they weren't rivals in that. Uh, Rathenau was involved with electricity and Stinnes with coal and steel. But protecting his own interests, Stinnes wants the coal delivery absolutely slashed. And Rathenau was a person who wanted to, as much as possible, uh, fulfill the obligations that had been set forward in the treaty. So negotiations come to a halt. There's also maybe a little flavor of anti-Semitism in his relationship with Stinnes, in that Stinnes calls him someone with the soul of an alien race. Joseph Wirth, center party politician and finance minister, sides with Rathenau. And despite ongoing public criticism, <coughs> he becomes privy to economic policy. And crucially here, at last, he has a political mentor 
not just a mentor, but someone who is in the highest position of all. Because Wirth becomes Chancellor in 19, May 1921. Rathenau is now on the verge of a political breakthrough, breakthrough. Having repeatedly rejected and been rejected as a party man, he manages to alienate even those who admired him being socially gauche and politically inconsistent. Now is his moment. And it's based on the solid facts of his achievements as an industrialist and a businessman, a negotiator with international experience. Not his writings, nor his social contacts, but his expertise in the creation of large-scale economic systems. He is the man for the hour. He's indispensable to work because Germany is in deep crisis. On the 5th of May 1921, the London ultimatum is issued. The Allied demand for 20 billion gold marks payable by the 11th of May, with another 132 billion payable in further installments. The cabinet resigns. Many thought that Germany was now ungovernable, and this was another one of Rathenau's prophecies from several years previously. He felt that if Germany lost the war that they were about to embark on, they would eventually be taken over and administered by the Allies. Um, the French were now threatening to occupy the entire Ruhr region. Uh, everything is chaotic. So Rathenau accepts the post in the cabinet as Minister of Reconstruction. Who would have thought even just a few weeks previously that a Jew, previously considered unfit for office, unfit for even <coughs> serving in the parliament, would uh, become a cabinet minister. He certainly was up to the task. Endless meetings, other discussions, Reichstag obligation, vast correspondence, meetings with special envoys, ambassadors, and government officials. On July 21st, he sets out a new approach, a policy of fulfillment. This is to help reinstate Germany within the international community and allow her to be a partner in the rebuilding of Europe. During this time, the early years of the Pollock, there was much violent unrest with strikes in December 1918, January 19, March and April, and then in March 1920, working class demonstrations and rioting in Berlin. As already mentioned, Matthias Erzberger was assassinated in August 1921, and Rathenau received increasing numbers of violent threats. A friend quoted to him in full the five verses of a song, the, stanza, the refrain of which goes, and please excuse my pronunciation, Kanalt ab den Walter Rathenau, die gottverdammte Judensau. Shoot Walter Rathenau, the goddamn Jewish pig. Rathenau received even more verbal attacks and insults from two parliamentary parties, and most, most aggressive being Karl Helferich. At the end of 22, he becomes Germany's Minister of Foreign Affairs, which gives him the opportunity to directly impact the restoration of his country's international standing. Now, this was as a result of negotiations we carried out with the British in November and December 21, trying to get a moratorium on the payments, repayments. And because he managed to get a short um, moratorium, he was rewarded with this political post. Now, everyone, all the uh, parties, uh, the Allies and Germany, agree to a meeting in Genoa. Uh, the possibility of fulfillment of the requirements of the Versailles Treaty for reparations for Germany is uh, reducing dramatically. Inflation is increasing. America decides not to participate, which means it can't be a really sensible uh, agreement. And uh, Germany and the Soviet Union were not treated as equals at this conference at Genoa. The Soviets were being housed 30 kilometers away in Rapallo. The Russians hoped to work out with the other outcast nation, Germany, an agreement that would improve their economic position while signaling their political independence. And they had stopped on the way to Italy in Berlin, hoping to do a behind-the-scenes deal, which didn't work out. 
Upon their arrival at Genoa, however, the Russians were welcomed by Britain and France, and Germany was left out in the cold. Horrified at the implication that Russia, supported by the Western powers, might present her own demands for reparations, Rathenau completed the accord that had not been finalized in Berlin, and although the British tried at the last minute to win over Rathenau by issuing him an invitation to tea, he um, signed the Rapallo Accord with Russia on the 16th of April. It put an end to any demands for reparations between Russia and Germany and established full diplomatic relations, putting their economic cooperation on a most favored nation basis. Before Rapallo, Rathenau had been hailed in the British press for his realistic approach, his wisdom and acumen in financial matters. Now he was a pan-German imperialist who destroyed the solidarity of the civilized nations by signing an agreement with the barbaric Soviets. At home, Rathenau was blamed with the failure to reduce the burden of reparations, the galloping inflation that appeared to be caused by it, collaboration with the despicable Bolsheviks, and the demise of the middle class through the insensate financial burdens placed on them. At home too, just before and after Genoa, the anti-Semitic attacks on Rathenau grew louder and more frequent. Why, Rathenau asked a political colleague, do people hate me so awfully? The reply came, simply because you are a Jew and successfully manage Germany's foreign policy. You are a living contradiction of the anti-Semitic theories on the harmfulness of Judaism on Germany. That's why they want you killed. Thank you. Thank you.